not the norm. This mm -hmm. is a, a moving and a shaking uh, chapter. Actually, it's a community of those information professionals, knowledge navigators, and intelligence officers and librarians uh, who are making a difference for so many people in campuses, communities, corporations, and government agencies. So we are delighted to be starting off our reboot with uh, some action uh, conversation and plans uh, for you. And this is also a, uh, a little snippet from what uh, people will be enjoying and benefiting from at uh, Internet Librarian 2022. What year is this for Internet Librarian, Jane? You're on mute. 26. Okay, and I invite everyone, unless there are uh, people screaming, dogs barking, uh, horns going off, I do invite you to stay off mute. I know that's not what people say on any of these Zoom things, but you know what? The problem is then when you want to interject and ask something um, or to contribute to the conversation, uh, suddenly you're on mute and there's this pause. So just stay off mute unless there's undue background noise. Uh, so uh, our two speakers today are, of course, uh, Gary Price and Mary Ellen Bates, which I suspect is why uh, so many people have registered for this and why we've chosen to take it directly to YouTube as well. Just before I introduce them, I do want to say that uh, Jane Dysart, who is uh, our illustrious leader for these uh, Nexter chats, uh, taking you to Next from now, has uh, scheduled yet another chat for you in two weeks on October the 4th, and that is with Stephen Abram, who has joined us here today, and also with Brian Pitchman. Many of you may know Brian from the Evolve Project, and if you are at any of Information Today's uh, library-based conferences, Brian is always bringing the latest and greatest uh, technologies to us, and Stephen is known for helping us understand what the hell we do with these uh, in libraries and why we should care. And so they are going to be uh, talking about uh, what's next in technology. They are great industry watchers and they take us along with them. And we certainly appreciate that. So that is gonna be on October the 4th and those registration links are up for you. But today we are talking with Mary Ellen Bates. Mary Ellen, wave, can we all see Mary Ellen? Let me just bring her here, I'm going to, uh, I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to know how to do this by now, Mary Ellen. There we are in spotlighting you for everyone. There she is, Mary Ellen Bates, who is with Bates uh, Information Services. But really, we just know her as Mary Ellen Bates, who has been uh, bringing us the advice and the know-how for so many years, not only to running uh, information service businesses, but also to how to dig deep into the web and benefit from that. And of course cohort in crime here, add spotlight, spotlight on you, Mr. Price, Gary Price uh, from ground zero, as we say in Washington, <laughs> actually in Silver Springs. Did I get that right, Gary? Singular, but it's fine. Silver Spring. Yeah. Springy. Okay. Just like Tigger. And uh, um, Gary is, of course, with uh, InfoDocket and uh, also has some involvement with the Info DJs, if you have a look at that. But he's so... Uh, renowned for his work with organizations, particularly with ARL in the ARL uh, update every day and many other customized uh, updates for organizations. Both of them really make the web manageable for us, uh, help us to fulfill our roles as uh, those knowledge navigators for the people that we are helping, enabling, supporting. And they're both uh, the leaders in the Search Academy, which will be occurring at Internet Librarian in Monterey. You can still get your tickets and come join us. And um, in a couple of weeks, three weeks, I think, we will be in Monterey. So who are we starting with today? Mary Ellen? Gary? Mary Ellen, would you like to begin? Uh I can, but if you'd like to, Gary, you're welcome to. Would you like to start? I would be happy to. Okay. All right. I'm just going to. I got to tell you, I bought my ticket for Monterey yesterday. Oh. And I am so excited <laughs> as what had become a tradition pre-COVID was for an evening out with Mary Ellen. 
And I'm looking forward to hopefully doing it again. Well, hello from just outside of Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mar uh, thank you, Rebecca, for the lovely introduction. And it's great to see so many friends on the call today. Um, as is my normal operation, um, I have plenty to share and not enough time to share it. Some of these, <laughs> some of these things are so new that um, I'm looking at them for fuller, more, uh, more complete in-depth over um, lookovers when we're in Monterey, and then of course, when everybody here is joining me in Washington in the spring. But the web page or the spreadsheet keeps me a, bit, a little bit better organized is already live and either one of these two URLs. This one is hosted on a Google uh, server, but I've learned that some people cannot get the Google servers from their work. So this uh, will not work. But this URL hosted on Zoho will hopefully work. So, and Gary, course, yes. did you share? Did you share? Put it in the chat for us. Well, I have to share my screen first. That would be the oh, opportunity all right. thing to okay. do. And can you share the uh, the link with us? And of course, I will share the link with you as well. Thank you. Make it easy to copy and paste. Uh, do that. And we can all do that. That's a good exercise. And if that doesn't work, this should work. And if this doesn't work, it's working. Uh, if neither of those works, feel free to email me and I'll send you the URL. Um, you were nice enough to mention InfoDocket, which is something I've been doing now for over a decade, well, close to a decade for a uh, library journal. And then the other thing I'm really proud of that started during COVID was something I'm doing now for another Canadian, specifically our friend Mary Lee Kennedy and my boss. And this started off very organically. I was sending Mary Lee all sorts of interesting things. She said, Oh, this is really cool. Can I share it with uh, my ARL staff a few weeks later? Can we share it with everybody? And it's never going to be the uh, the most uh, widely distributed newsletter, because but the people, it's a real who's who of the people who see it. And by the way, uh, it's updated Monday through Thursday. It's not just ARL member news. There's plenty of that. But other things that we, we're thinking people in the higher ed, the higher ed library space, might find useful. And unlike InfoDocket, uh, it is available via email. So that's one thing to promote. The second- Gary, thing, do you want to mention what you're doing for um, SLA Canada too? You do an intelligence- uh -huh. I am doing, that. that is back better than ever. And we'll get started with that. And I'm also doing something similar to what I'm doing for ARL. We're going to get that going again for SLA Canada. Um, with just interesting things I come across um, in my 24-7 work life. So thank you for reminding me of that, Jane. Uh, one of the other things I've done during COVID was hook up with a, my friend and now colleague, Curtis Michelson, and we started our company called InfoDJ, InfoDJ.io. But it's great. You can go to the website, but I have a reason for you to go to the website. So we're giving away a couple of free tools. One, this is kind of a what your appetite type of resource. This is a database. It's called Bethany. And this is a sampler version of Bethany. Uh, Bethany is at this point about 300. And, the sampler version is about 300 uh, trade magazines. And it's everything from Rice News Today. There's a good example. This, we already, and I know some of the people from the organization, we now are actually have clients for the full version of this database, which is over 2,300 sources as of today. One of the things that I found as a librarian years ago, and it's called Bethany because I started doing it while sitting around the pool in Bethany Beach, Delaware, about five years ago. I've always loved trade magazines. Duh, that most people could figure that out about me. But... Uh, but there was never a good open web directory of them. So I started creating my own with 50, 60, and now we're up to 2,300, primarily English language trade magazines. So everything from Rice Today to Car Wash Weekly. So now um, we are selling the full version of this database and we already have a couple of clients. And we're also working to try to make all the underlying sources in the database full text searchable. So that's something else that's coming. And one of the things we know is that 
trade publications, business press, and then of course the blog, similar types of digital only blogs are great ways, great places to find information early on, if you like, in the publication cycle. Things that will never be reported on in a trade in, in the main in the mainstream press, they're often reported on in, in a trade publication. Plus, what we have found is that the journalists who write for these trade publications are experts in whatever they're writing on because they're covering it 24 seven. So additional people to tap. I'm interested in, in pizza delivery technology in Ontario. Well, there happens to be Canadian Pizza Weekly or whatever. They have a journalist who is covering that. You need to learn about that. Often contacting that journalist will clue you into more people to talk to, resources to get, so on and so forth. So it's actually leveraging not only the publication itself and what's being written, but the people who work for the publication. So that's um, Bethany, and that's the sampler version. If anybody's interested in taking a full look at the full database, um, give me a drop me an email, and we'll we'll talk to you and show you the full resource. The other thing I want to mention is this baby. Um, this is called Open Web Tools. For years, people have said to me, and it's not people have said to me, why why don't let me show you another version of it just so you get an idea of what's in here. We go here, here, here we go. Mr. Price, yes. can you just drag your um, what you're showing over a bit because we can see your email behind it or we see something behind, there you go. Just move it because yeah, there we go. Thank there you. Go. So really <laughs> what you're finding in open web tools are all of these specialty databases and resources I've been talking about at conferences for year for years, decades like, when, when Jane said how long Internet Librarian has been going on, I'm like, oh my God, I've been to just about every one. But this is all these resources and more. As a matter of fact, I just opened, I added a new one today. And as of now, there's 433 of them. It's a constantly updated database of open web resources. Pretty simple. Wow. Everything from state here, legis uh, tracking legislation in the US, the US Registry of Exonerations, all these different open web specialty databases, invisible web, which was a term we don't use anymore, but all these databases, I'm slowly but surely adding to this collection. And through that open web tools interface, we've added some metadata and now they're searchable. So it's a database of databases, if you like. Moving on, I just wanted to point these out. Um, because I just learned about these yesterday. Here in the States, unfortunately, book censorship is all over the place. And I just wanted to point out these two databases, one from every library, John Chiraska. Mm -hmm. uh, he is working with this uh, Dr. Magnuson, and this is a database of book censorship attacks all over the US. It just goes on and on and on and on, which- Oh, we're still at the seas. Yeah, which oh, is about, so that's one database. And the other one was also updated yesterday or announced yesterday. And this is from Penn America. And this focuses on school book bans. So there are two specialty databases focusing on what unfortunately is a very, um, I hate to say a hot topic these days. And that is the censorship and the banning of books, both in public libraries and in school libraries. So those are two brand new or recently updated databases that focus on that material. And you can actually see where it's happening, uh, if it was successful, uh, and the actual title of the book. So there you go. I was gonna take the time to show this to you today, but one, it's not working, who knows why, <laughs> but this has been another very, it's been written about a lot in the last couple of years, and this is called the script. As you can see, it works for audio and video. In a nutshell, it's incredible how well this works. You've got audio, you upload your audio file to the script, you upload your video file like this presentation today. So when we're done, for example, Rebecca could upload the video to Descript, and some of this is free, more freemium, if you like. Some of it is free, 
Some of it is extra features, obviously, if you pay for it. We're done with today's presentation. Goodbye. We, um, Rebecca uploads it to the script. It creates a text transcript, right? And now editing the video is as simple as deleting words in the text transcript. It's that simple. You can, you can even create uh, AI to try to match your voice if you have to dub something in. But now, uh, now editing the video or audio file is as simple as deleting something, as you can see, is as, as, as simple as deleting something in a text transcript. Say so a video word processor is what they call it. And it works really well. So that's something that you might want to take a look at as well. And as I said a moment ago, you can overdub with our extremely realistic text-to-speech voices, that type of thing. It makes video and audio editing as simple as using a word processor. I want to point out this one as well. This one gets by a lot of people. We're now in the age of not only are we getting text material to share with users, obviously, journal articles, trade magazine articles, and so forth, but we're also getting the data sets. This is called Mendeley data. It's from Elsevier. But what this is doing is a federated search of, I'll just type in the word Canada so you can see, this is pulling data sets from all of these different data repositories. So instead of having to go to each one and seeing if your site search works, this is doing, a, uh, as I said, a federated search of, I think, well over 100 data repositories around the world and aggregates all the results into one search set. So now if I'm interested in this data set from the Canadian National Earthquake Warning System, um, you click and it tells you how to go actually go ahead and, and, and download it. So instead of just searching for text, now data sets are becoming more readily available. And this is a great tool if you wanna search multiple data sets from the outset. And of course, as you can see, you can then go back and limit to specific data sets. And of course, there's other types of material in here as well. There's some imagery, there's some video, um, so audio files, so on and so forth. So that is, men don't let the name Mendeley allow you to think that it's just people uploading resources and papers to Mendeley. This is a full, this is a, a, a federated search tool for these data repositories and others. Great. And Gary, I did go back into the open web tools and just did a, a Canada search and there are Canadian tools on there. Of course. Okay, well, thank you. As Rebecca and Jane and Stephen know, Stephen gave me one of my most proud, my, a title I'm most proud of, and that is America's number one Canuckophile. So <laughs> as, I'm si as I'm sitting here looking at Stephen, it's a title I use very, I love, and uh, I appreciate it, Stephen. Uh, so we have open web tools. Now this one, I've, I actually subscribe to you. You can do one-offs for free, but let me open up if I can find the right tab. Close all these. Uh, let's close some of these out. Here we go. This is called Scholar C. This will work on any web page or any PDF. You can, you can just give it the URL of the PDF or the web page, or if you have it locally on your computer, you can upload it from there. This is a, you know, one of the things that all of us in the library world here and here, and we, we also know it, is that there's just too much out there and people don't have the time to read the 45 page article, or even in some cases, the, the extended article in the Globe and Mail, you know what I mean? So this is trying to use, trying, it's not perfect, what is, but this is using AI to create an abbreviated, a, um, a smaller, shorter version of whatever you upload to it. And then also call those resources out, those features out. So here's a paper that I uploaded a couple of weeks ago from the uh, OECD International Transport Forum, with just a straight old PDF. I click on it and you get what they call a summary flashcard. It will extract. So this is all about data extraction. 
It will extract the key concepts from the paper. Again, this is using their AI. So if, it, if it's not 100% correct, you can go ahead and, uh, and add in your own. You can edit it and you can add in your own. And as a matter of fact, you can save all the underlying links, for example, underlying links rather. Get rid of this, I have too many things open here. I can, I can save all of these underlying links. Right now, if you click on any of these, they'll take you to Wikipedia. But if you go into edit, you can change where the link resolves to. Then they will create their own using their AI version of the abstract. Important points are in, highlighted in blue and contributions are highlighted in kind of a orangey red type of thing. It will then extract what they believe are the highlights of the paper. You know, and you can change how many highlights it extracts, I think from one to a hundred. And of course, based on the length, it'll give you a summary of the article. This is again, using their AI, get that. It will extract, now this is really cool. If there are tables in the document, text tables, it will extract those and allow you to download them into an Excel file with just one click. So it sees the text table and it will move it right into an Excel file for you. It will extract in some cases images from the paper. It provides you, let me go back, I'm sorry. It provides you the full text of the paper. It, again, it's, it's extracting all this and putting this into this organizational, what they call flashcard. So there's the full text, there's the introduction with important points highlighted via their uh, AI. Um, if, it finds, if it finds things with numbers, for example, 1000, I found the number 1000 and it kind of gives you the work, where it is in context their conclusion, blah, blah, blah. And then it extracts all of the citations for you and allows you with one click, if it's open, to go to Unpaywall to get a copy, to go to another really cool database called Cite, which is also listed on the page. Cite is looking, um, well, I'll show you in a second. And if somebody else has already run the paper, you can go directly to the findings, the, um, the flashcard. So you can do this for free is one-offs, but then of course, for a small subscription fee, you can then start organizing things and share things in libraries, so on and so forth. I have found, oh, and by the way, it just does not work. It even, you can even set this up that every time an article via the RSS feed of whatever news source you're interested in uh, sends out an article, it will automatically take the RSS feed and create their own flashcard for whatever that article is, whether it be from the New York Times whether it be from the Globe and Mail, CNN, so on and so forth. So this is one of the better tools I've seen over the last year and one that I'm using quite a bit and one that InfoDJ is about to use with one of our clients. Uh, I mentioned site. So let me show you that. This is done by basically one guy in a small team in Brooklyn. The idea here, and again, you can get a trial, but what they're doing here is they are extracting citation statements. You're not just seeing the citation to a paper, but you're seeing the citation in context of the inside of the actual paper. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So instead of just saying this is from Fan et al. 2006, you're getting what they're actually saying in, in kind of a you know a couple a hundred words or so. So, and then of course their business model, one obviously is to buy, the, to buy the service, but the other then, for example, if you don't have access to a library, uh, you can go ahead and buy or rent the paper, so on and so forth. But I have to say in doing what I do on a daily basis, looking at the industry, I have seen, oh, by the way, they have great alerts as well. But uh, as I see companies come and go, and a lot of them go, this company is getting more getting a lot of attention, a lot of new partnerships. So again, it's not just the citation, it's a citation statement, and which allows you to see whatever is being cited in context of the actual underlying paper where it's being cited. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, fantastic. So really? Gary, Gary, give us your uh, the last favorite, and then we'll go to Mary Ellen, and then we'll right. open it up for questions right. from both of you. Right. 
Uh, okay. Uh, let's do. What's your fave? Yeah. <laughs> think tank directory. Think tank directory. Think tanks directory. There it is. Right. Underneath. Go. Well, there you go. There you go. Jane, I've loved you for years, decades. I, I appreciate you pointing out yet another freebie from Info DJs. And this is just a directory that we took of think tanks. And uh, my business partner, Curtis, had a lot of value added to it. And it works. So if you want to find a think tank in France, I don't understand. We must have some type of technical issue today, which I will go look into. But it's just a very straightforward think tank directory, which for research purposes, we all know think tanks can be not only great unto themselves, but they can be great starting points about where to find additional authoritative information. I do want to mention before we turn it over to take a look at either insightful lit maps and or um, connected papers, which add a visualization element to academic material and allows you to see the relationships very quickly and easily. Uh, oh, and, yeah, and Andy search. I just learned about this one the other day. This is the whole idea. We've seen it before. We're going to see it again of not just give, of actually giving you an answer, not just a link. They're trying it and they're leveraging Wolfram Alpha with it. Enough of me. I'm going to turn it over now to my friend, um, mm -hmm. Mary Ellen Bates. Fantastic. I don't know. I'm exhausted. I just would <laughs> like to see in the chat uh, how many of you got one new tool that you'd never heard of before. And that was my goal. <laughs> That's great. Did everybody get one new tool? Can you just put in yes or nada or yes? Okay, we have some yeses. And welcome to those who have just joined us. This is live on YouTube right now. So that means it will be there for you to go back to. And I'm also going to uh, share uh, the link to Gary's spreadsheet that I have here in the chat so that you can get it. And uh, it's incredible. Of course, I keep looking up uh, Canada in everything that you've given us, Gary, and it's uh, quite amazing mm -hmm. how many Canadian sources are there. Okay, terrific. And I'm going to remove, I'm removing you, Gary, I'm removing your spotlight. There we go. And uh, I'm spotlighting Mary Ellen Bates. There you are. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, for waiting. And I hope you're not exhausted. Oh, God. <laughs> no, because I didn't have to pull all those things together. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay, let me share my screen. Oh, good. Mary Ellen's slides are in the chat as well, but don't go there yet. <laughs> or you can, you can follow along if you like. Okay, um, okay. so let's see. Let me... There we go. Um, so I've got uh, this all working out okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, my, I've got a, a few different things to cover, just thinking about super searcher tips generally. And the first one is just realizing how differently we approach searching now than we did a few years ago. So um, this is kind of the think different part of my talk. So the first thing, and I, and I think we really need to, um, especially those of us that have been doing searches for a long time. And so it kind of feels like second nature. Um, we need to think a, a little more before we start each search. So when we get a request, if it's something that we already pretty much have an idea of the info landscape, you know, you generally know what to expect. It's like, oh, it's one of those kinds of questions. Okay. When you get one of those, the first thing that I do is I question my assumptions. I, if it sounds familiar, I might be sliding into, a, oh, yeah, that's always this. And I, I have shared a horror story, which I will not share today for um, the sake of time, of when I was totally embarrassed about making an assumption from a longtime client. And I thought I knew what he was talking about, and, and I didn't. And it was very embarrassing. So um, when it sounds like it's something you know a lot about, make sure that it really is. And look for, you know, ask yourself distinctly, you know, is how is this different from the last questions that I've been doing on this topic? To make sure you don't just go down into a rut that isn't really helpful. Um, obviously you start focused and then expand as you need to. So this is the, um, you know, don't get distracted by the, 
um, by the outliers as much because you know that you're going to be finding a lot of outliers. I would, I tend to log into Google and use Google for these kinds of searches because I actually value the search tracking that Google does within a search. Yes, it's annoying that if you search for something on Amazon, you know, the ads follow you around everywhere. I know it's the cross we all bear. And when I'm doing, a, you know, a series of searches on a topic, I like the fact that Google is saying, I already showed you, you know, I know that you're looking at this and you're refining it to this aspect. And I find that I do get better results that way. So I would, especially because you're not flailing, if it's an area that you know something about, that you might benefit from uh, taking advantage of the search tracking that Google does when you sign in. Um, I also am now always using one alternate search engine just for one search when on, on any series of, of queries that I'm doing for a project. Um, I'll talk about a few of the ones that I've been using these days. Doesn't even matter a whole lot which one. I just think it's really important to always try, see what you find in a non-Google search because guaranteed you will find different things than what you found in Google. If, on the other hand, you don't know the information landscape for this project real well, and that's like my entire life. So that's as much as I love being an infopreneur and having lots of different clients in lots of different industries. So it's never boring. Um, the problem is that I also get the questions where I have no idea where to start because I haven't thought about this industry before. So in those kinds of situations, um, obviously I start broad and I just look for clues. In fact, and this is this is something that I probably don't admit very much outside the library circles. Thank you very much. Um, but I will, if it's something I don't know anything about, I will go to Wikipedia, not because it's the last source on anything, but because it's at least got sort of a minimum outline of what I should think about. So not even noticing particularly the words, but just the format. What are the subheads in the Wikipedia article that sort of show me where the main areas of concern, of concern or discussion are, for example? Um, for some narrow topics where Wikipedia doesn't come in well, um, I often look for a libguide to see because often, you know, a university may be looking at a new or bleeding edge technology, for example, and that library is getting a lot of questions on that area from their students and they're more likely to put out a libguide. Or in the context of what you're looking for, maybe you want to start with government sources because you know that's an unbiased um, place to start looking for statistics or trends or whatever. All this to say, it depends on what an authoritative or vetted source is in your context for this question. But I'm not, I'm not shy about starting there and admitting that I may not know what the authoritative source is without you know starting at one of the obvious places like that. Um, I tend to, when it's when it's a topic I don't know a lot about, where I really am kind of flailing and it's sort of embarrassing because I don't know what I'm going to find till I find it, I don't like Google tracking those searches because often they're way off. You know, I wound up using words that, no, that's conveying the wrong idea. That gets me all that other stuff. No, no, no. So using a search engine that's non-tracking, that's, that's more privacy-oriented, yeah then it's not accounting for the last five queries that I did. And so I'm getting a clean, a clean search every time, which is useful when I don't know where a good starting point is. Then once I've sort of got a clue and figure out where the buzzwords are and that kind of stuff, then I may go over to Google and use its search tracking again, once I kind of know I'm on the right path. So those are sort of the two different approaches that I take depending on whether I have a clue of what I'm doing or not. <clears throat> and you don't have to admit it that way. Just those one of those things. Okay. I know. None of us, none of us are clueless in our searches and all children are above average. So anyway, um my 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 super searcher results get better when I dot dot dot. Um, number one is when I just try one more thing. I'm always amazed at how after I've done all my searches, I'm not really finding what I want. I'm feeling a little bit frustrated. If I just like, oh, heck, 
just blurt or like what's what are the words that seem to have come up the most just do something ugly it doesn't have to look pretty no one else has to see it it's just between you and the search engine but just try one more and i would say about a quarter of the time i get something good from doing that one last hail mary throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks kind of search and so it doesn't take more than 30 seconds and you've got a good enough chance of finding something good um I have to keep reminding myself of what the user or the client will be doing with what I send them. Meaning if I, I can, I can get too into the weeds, I can get too, but there, wait, there's more, there's always more, but let me tell you about this. You know, it's really easy to just get to, to get into the thrill of the hunt. It's what makes us good info pros, as far as I'm concerned. And this is where I really have to rein myself in and say, no, no, no. All that my client is doing is a uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Maybe they're doing something that really requires everything, but a lot of times it doesn't need all that extra work. I'm just putting in, you know, excessive time for this project. So sometimes I have to just say, wait, what I have is good enough. And in fact, sometimes close enough is good enough. We try finding the exact answer. We, I often try finding the exact answer and I wind up coming up short. But then when I realize maybe this is the closest I can get, or this is the answer I can, this is the question I can answer. It's not exactly what you're asking, but it's the best I'm going to be able to get. So just kind of our, ourselves getting over that, that need to be perfect or to get the ideal search results. Um, one of my super searcher tips is to expand what an answer looks like. And here's the deal. The easy answers are gone. I, I feel lucky that I started out as a librarian in the ancient golden days before the internet where my the head librarian told me you can answer 80% of reference desk questions with a dictionary, an almanac, and a street map. So um, it was lovely because I could feel smart all day long and never have to actually think all that much about the creative things. So those days are gone if they ever were really around. So I wind up when I can't find an easy answer, I start looking at what else would help answer the question. These may not be things that my client will remember to ask me for. I need to remember to offer it or to bring it onto the table when I'm tackling it. So, and these are all real things that I've done when I couldn't find anything else through the regular sources that I use when I'm looking for an answer to a client's um, information need. So if I'm doing research on an individual, I may look to see what their social media, their public social media profiles look like. It's amazing what you find sometimes there. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I've sometimes looked at product descriptions on companies' websites to get an idea of the of the direction of a market to see which of their products they're highlighting or what the use cases are for these products to get a sense of what other companies in that field are doing. So again, it's looking at clues to tell me an answer or the old librarian's trick of, you know, going through the table of contents for market research reports and seeing what information you can glean from there, like, um, the key competitors or the key markets and that sort of thing. Um, I also look at, at what else would address the question. What else, where else could I find an answer? So if I can't find exactly this, what's parallel to it? This probably has the same indicators as what I'm looking for. Or what would the signals that this situation would be giving off if it were the case? And can I look for those signals? Can I see mentions of a municipality, you know, spending money on a certain thing to indicate whatever. So it's like thinking really like a detective and it's like, what kind of clues could I be looking for that might give me an answer that I might want to give my client? The, the hard thing about this is that it takes more explanation in the results. It isn't just like handing them off a sheet of paper and saying, have at it, you know, look what I found you. Um, and it takes more, here's what I was able to find and here's what this tells you, explaining to people what it means means. Um, all of this is just like, how else do we use <clears throat> the information finding and organ and analyzing skills that we have as info pros to address the tougher questions that we're dealing with? Okay. Um, my next favorite question or favorite thing to, to deal with is what do you do when you find no answers? And even super searchers find nothing sometimes. And here's the deal. 
First, I make sure that I do everything I can to avoid finding nothing. So that means um, doing a reference interview that anticipates problems. And I can't tell you enough how a good reference interview ensures good searching, include ensures good research results. So I always make sure I understand for every single question, what's the context? What is going on behind the scene? Why are they asking me this question? I ask them, what will you be doing with what I send you? Is it going to be sent off to a team? Is it being incorporated into a slide deck? Is it just for background material? That tells me a lot about how the format could add value if I know what they're going to be doing with the content. How much information do you expect me to find? I can't tell you how useful that is to find out whether they even think there's anything out there. How many times you can raise your hand or not, but everyone's had this experience where you look, you can't find anything. You go to your client. I'm so sorry. I can't find anything. And your client's like, oh, I didn't think you'd find anything anyway. When that happens, I just um, remind myself that there's no internet in jail. Um, so, and, and the last question that I find is, is always really useful is if I can't find exactly what you're looking for, what would be second best? This is a really powerful question for finding out what your, um, what, what the underlying information need is from your client. It's really great, great, great question. Okay. Then looking at why you found either no results or no, no meaningful or useful results. And these are just, use this as a checklist because I'd be, I'm surprised at, at how often I do all of these. And it's important to do this before you give up or go on to another type of a question. Check for typos, the wrong logic or syntax, especially when you're using a fee-based online service that will just give you no results rather than telling you that you did the wrong thing. Making sure you're in the right database or index. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit the number of times I've found that I can't find anything because I'm searching the wrong place. An overly specific query. This is when we try to get too cute. We try to get exactly the right thing and we miss out on what could be useful enough. We preclude the possibility of seeing outliers and significant, you know, un un unexpected results. Um, check your un unquestioned assumptions about where you would find the information or what it would look like when you find it. Not using terms of art for this topic in the context that it that it shows up in in uh, in the information sources that you're looking for, and seeking perfection rather than good enough. And this this is my my worst one. Is like I can't find exactly this. I need to back up and see what's good enough for this client. Good enough has become unfortunately my new mantra. I'm not proud of it, but sometimes it just has to happen. And then when you don't find anything, it's this is where you pivot. You look for related or parallel information. You look for the signals. You look at who the stakeholders are. Who else would care about this and what are they doing? So again, if they're not talking about it, maybe that indicates people don't see it as an issue. I'll often run this by a colleague in an anonymized way if I have to um, for the kind of work that I do. And just like, what am I missing here? Is there something that's just unexpected? And then I do one last Hail Mary, you know, see if I can find something just because. And then I just tell a story. And this is where it's in the deliverable that, that you add the value. So are the gaps, I'm not finding anything more than two years ago. Is there something that happened two years ago that changed things? What do I need to look for in the news during a weird period of time? Does finding nothing tell me something? Does it mean that nobody cares about this topic, that people have looked at it and just don't think it's it's fruitful or likely or whatever? Or alternatively, does it mean that no one's thought of it this way before? And you can figure that out just from looking at the context of what things are that you are finding. This is information about information. What approach would you recommend next? So again, this is like owning our information skills and saying, here's what I didn't find. And based on the info landscape that I was looking at, here are the next best stops. Okay. And I'm, yes, I'm going to move on quickly because I want to have some time for questions. So I will go as quickly as I can. A few tips on searching the 800 pound gorilla that is Google today. Um, as, as you know, there are no more than 400 search results per search, which means that every search result counts. You need to be really careful. Instead of doing a really broad search, 
I'm being much more focused. I date limit every search. Unless I specifically need something from 10 years ago, I limit everything to the last year or two. I'll often limit by format, if that makes sense. If I need to search for something outside the US where I'm, limit, where I'm located, I'll use a VPN so that I'm searching that country's version of the Google search engine because it looks different than the one that you'll see from your own country. Remember that Google is expecting spoken queries. The majority of queries that Google handles are coming from mobile devices. Those kinds of queries are, are where do I find? We actually use all those noise words when we're, when we're saying a question into you know, Google or, or any of the Google properties. And as opposed to when we're sitting at our at our keyboard at, at the office and we're doing a query. We use search logic, we use and, or, we use quote marks, we use parentheses. It's a very different structure. If you're not finding what you want by doing your grown up laptop typed queries, think about how you would express this query if you were speaking it and try putting it in that way. You will get different results every time. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, when you don't know where to start, this is one of those when you're flailing around a little bit. I sometimes use Google's, they call them smart answers, I call them smart-ish, um, but they're really useful just to think about what am I missing. So I did, I was going into the thermal, geothermal um, power market, didn't know where to start, just put in the word geothermal. And here's what I got. I mean, these are, all, this is all smart answers. So I got the people often also ask part is sort of aspects of the question, not just geothermal, but what aspect of geothermal do you want? Things to know shows me where some controversies are. The Wikipedia entry gives me a starting point if I just don't know where the authoritative organizations are. And then the C results about gives me other ways of phrasing or looking at the concept. So all of this by me not presuming that I know much, it gave me some nice clues just looking at the screen. This is just from the search result. Another thing to taking advantage of how Google works, I often skip the first page of Google search results. I start at the 10th one, especially if it's a more obscure or difficult to find topic. I'm looking for the things that aren't as SEO'd so that they're not as optimized to show up at the beginning. They're, they, the ones at the top tend to get what, what are described as the, the obvious answers, but those may not be the most useful ones. So if, it's look, if you're looking for something obscure, start on the second page. Look for not the right answer, but just the next source. So often when I'm searching, when I'm scanning Google search results, I don't even look at the headlines. All I do is look at the URLs. I'm just looking for a good URL for a source that I can go to and then do all the searching myself. Um, I stay focused on the underlying questions so that I don't get distracted by trying to just match the concepts that I need. Um, I'm going to skip this one just so that for lack of time, um, there we go. Um, I use Google's about this result feature sometimes for validation, but I think this is a really nice tool for us to show our users how we validate information sources. It's the three vertical dots on the right of every search result. So on this search result, for example, see those three dots there? If I click that, it gets me this about this result. It pops up as a, as a pop-up thing. And what I really like is that it tells you something about the source, if Google knows about it. It tells you why you found, why you got the words that were on the page. And it even says there was this other term that was related to your search, even though it wasn't one of your search terms. So I like this as a way of sort of popping the engine, popping the hood and seeing a little bit about how, how Google works um, in terms of its relevance ranking. Uh, let's see how, Rebecca, do I have two more minutes or should I stop right now? You have two minutes actually. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep up to the non-tracking search engines because I think those are important. And again, I sent you the, um, you've got the link to the full um, uh, slide so you can see the ones that I'm skipping over here. Um, I Like I said before, I encourage people to use one alternate search engine for every one of their searches, just for a couple of searches if you need to, not for a whole lot. 
but it always gets you something different. Try all four of these and see which ones work for the kinds of questions and the kinds of clients that you have. Okay, first one's DuckDuckGo. You know, everyone's heard about that one. Um, it's funded by uh, by AdWords primarily and um, and affiliate links. So there are ads, but they're not tracked by your series of searches, just by the words in the search that you're presenting right there. And in fact, you can even turn those keyword ads off. I like that you can you can focus by country, which is a nice feature. Um, lets you limit by day, week, month, or year, which is real. I always limit by year. And I like the um, infinite scroll to just like keep going when you can't find what you're looking for. U.com, which is in public beta now, um, it's funded by affiliate links. They may do keyword ads in the future. They don't do it now. And again, keyword ads are just based on what you typed in the search box for that query. It's not based on search tracking. Right now, it's more U.S. focused, but that's not intentional as much as just they're limiting it there. I mean, it's intentional right now because they're in beta, but they plan to go further out than that. So I would keep an eye out on it and see whether um, it looks more promising. You can't limit by year, which I don't appreciate. You can limit by region, which again is, is useful. The only way that you can get it to not track any of your searches is to specifically go into private mode and then it, it does no tracking at all. Um, Brave Search, search.brave.com is another one. They, what I like about them is they have these things called goggles that let you tweak the relevance ranking. So you can highlight, you can get to the move towards the top things having to do with science and medicine, or you can eliminate the 1000 most popular sites from the search results, or you can eliminate the copyright, the copycat, you know, duplicate sites. So it's really kind of a nice way of filtering things down a little bit. Yeah, it's a cool site. Um, and Neva, which is both ad and tracker free, they um, they really push for registration. Um, the main reason to do that is that you can customize what you consider to be authoritative sources and get those to be ranked more highly, which I really appreciate. So those are four alternative search engines that, that I think all have have a good possibility. I encourage you to use at least one of them for all of your searches. If you want to hear a lot more of what Gary and I and other speakers have to uh, present on this topic, please join us at Internet Librarian 2022 um, in just a month. I'm really excited about being there and I hope that I'll see you there too. If you have any other questions, there's my contact information and I will stop sharing now and hand it back to Rebecca. Wow. Wow. I hope everybody has us on uh, gallery mode. Thank you so much, you two. We have uh, eight minutes left, and I've already shared the, um, uh, the um, link to the YouTube, so you can go back, and I will, of course, put these links on the Dysart Jones uh, site. But I just want to ask you two, uh, first of all, are there any other questions? Jane, did you just get the answer to your question? I think you did, right? about uh, alternative search engines? I did, I did, I did. That was okay. the key part of, uh, of Mary Ellen's. And, you know, it always amazes me for both of you two that I always get excited about what you talk about. Yeah. And, you know, it's always something that's new and informative. So thank you both. <laughs> wow, amazing. <laughs> there we go. That's right. little, yes, yes, yes. Um, so you two, since there are no questions here, I get to ask a question, which is, um, what has been most, um, what's the most exciting uh, tool or app that you've uh, encountered recently? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll say it isn't a tool. For me, it's, it's totally been a mindset. Oh. It really, it's, it's understanding that the answer that the question that gets presented to me is often not the ideal question that they want answered. Like, duh, I've, I've known this since I went to library school, but I'm reminded of it even more that if, because I know about sources that my clients have no idea that I could use or could use in that way. And every one of your users frames their request to you in a way they think you can answer it. 
And I, I can't oh. repeat that enough. I think right. that's so important. And I've done it to other people too. I noticed that when I'm, I've, I've called up, you know, government experts and I'll ask the question in a way that I think will be easy for them to answer because I don't want to impose. And one time I actually heard someone say, well, why didn't you just ask me that in the first place? And I was like, <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was such a great reminder that everybody does that to us, too. They're asking you the question they think you can answer, not necessarily the question that they actually need answered. Right. Right. Touche. Absolutely. And your uh, your comments about, uh, you know, a good search starts with a really good what we call a reference interview, which is, a, you know, actually it's it's talking with them about how they're going to use this whatever it is that they're talking with you about. I thought that were excellent. Gary, what have you been excited about? Well, um, for me, well, one thing I want to say too about something else that Mary Ellen said is the word assumption. Mm. A lot of these tools, what you see there on Monday is different by Wednesday. <laughs> so just because you think the site offers this or doesn't offer that, you really need to spend some time, if possible, keeping up with this. And that's easier said than done. I absolutely know that. And then for me too, it's really cool to see, just to think that something that I started sitting poolside because I love trade magazines is now something that actually is a revenue stream for our business. But in terms of cool tools to answer your specific question, I mean, Descript, which is what I mentioned earlier, it makes video and audio editing as simple as using a, you know, as using a word processor. And I think that's something that's really, really useful. In terms of search, there is another little tool that I have listed on the page called Single File. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to make a really easy HTML copy of whatever web page you're looking at. You can annotate it and you can share it. But as I often talk about in my presentations, the internet of today, literally, the page might still be there tomorrow, but something on the page might have been removed, that type of thing. So I, I'm a firm believer that we should also be making as much as possible our own internet archive. And that might mean leveraging the Wayback Machine, but it also might mean using some tools that allow you to save web pages and web materials locally. Excellent. And you know what? I will, uh, when I I'll put the links up here, I will link to your previous SLA uh, Canada chat about that very topic when you went into detail about uh, creating our right. own internet archives and um, and supporting both internet archive and uh, the Wayback Machine, thank you. And Mary Ellen said, reminder, if you want to save the chat, click the three dots in the chat window and select save chat. There we are, excellent. I can't thank you two enough for helping us with our first reboot. Everybody that's been here, I think is, well, first of all, they're still here. That's always a sign. Um, that they are having a good time. And uh, for the uh, details that you've given us, your slides, Mary Ellen, uh, Gary, your, um, your spreadsheet, it'll all be at the Dysart Jones uh, SLA Canada site. And uh, we'll see you back here October 4th for Brian Pitchman and Stephen Abram. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.